Scott County, providing safe, healthy, and livable communities. information on Scott County Delivers topic elections and I see Chris Harder is here and she's going to kick us off. Good morning. Good morning Mr. <clears throat> Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, we are pleased this morning to bring to you um, representatives from our team of folks working on elections. We were last here in August of 2021 uh, and since then there have been changes to the things that are like really essential to the work of elections. And, and you are gonna hear a lot this morning about accuracy, transparency, and security. And so we're really excited to look at some of the data and talk about some of the changes and improvements that have been made since that time that really built on a really strong foundation. Um, and, and in fact, is better than it was two years ago. And you'll hear more about that. Um, I wanna extend a special uh, welcome. We have um, two representatives from our cities. Um, and a representative from the state, Secretary of State's office, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves, and they're especially happy to have those outside uh, guests with us today. So with that, I'd like the folks on the facilitator side of the table just to introduce who you are and what department you work in. And then, Julie, we'll start with you, and I'd like you to introduce who you are and what your role is in elections. And just because it factored a little bit into our prep conversations, just how long you've been involved in the work of elections. Good morning, Tony Winnicky, Transportation Services. Hi, Carrie, we met Economic Assistance. Good morning, Jake Grusing, Library. Good morning, Julie Hansen. I'm the um, Property and Customer Service Manager for Scott County. One of my roles is Elections Administrator. Um, I have been with Scott County for almost 24 years. I have been in this role for going on five. Um, so I've been the elections administrator for five years and involved in the periphery of elections for a few years before that. So thank you for having us this morning. Um, I'm Janice Fromm. I'm the property and customer service supervisor. I um, manage the passport office and the land records office, and I've been helping with elections since like 2016. I've been here since 2004. Good morning. My name is David Maeda. I'm the director of elections for the Minnesota Secretary of State's office. I've been involved with elections for around 25 years at the county and city level, and now, of course, at the state. Good morning. I'm Amy Jurek with the city of uh, Belle Plaine. I'm the finance director, and I've been working with elections since 2008, so about 15 years. Good morning, my name is Amy Olson. I'm the election admin administrator for the city of Credit River, and 2022 was my first year involved in elections. Good morning, I'm Chris Loggy. I'm in the community services um, division. I've been with the county for 21 years, been working in elections since 2014 probably. Um, currently my, what I focus on for elections is um, equipment, programming and testing, uh, UOCAVA ballots, uh, scanning um, absentee ballots, and uploading results to the state on election night. Oh, and sorry, <laughs> um, all of the different publications that are required. Good morning, I am Amanda Geis. I'm the property and customer service specialist. I've been with the county for almost 10 years and been doing election administration. Thank you. Uh, I want to say one more thing um, before we get started. Evan, could you go to page five, please? One of the data sets we included in this packet for you is um, a population projection of residents in Scott County or age 65 and over. And that group is going to impact future planning for this work area, really for most work areas in the county. Um, but it shows um, uh, past and some projections on the growth of that population and that demographic uh, going forward. Uh, and I know that folks on the panel may reference that later, so I just wanted you to know that that data set's in there on page five. So with that, Jake, you want to start us off? Sure, thank you. Uh, no particular page for this one, Evan. This is a high-level question based on the narrative. So as I was going through the packet, um, and Chris mentioned, your work to continuously improve from election to election. You guys get better and better with accuracy, security, and transparency. It was noted here that Mr. Maeda and his office called you the gold standard in the most recent election. But in the preceding paragraph, it says Scott County has no full-time election staff. 
And I'd like to, that seems pretty extraordinary to me. So I'd like to know, one, is that typical for metro area counties? And two, how do you, how do, you do that then? I can't say that it is typical. It is very unusual. Um, we've been, and I'm sure David um, knows better statewide as far as I do, but uh, we've done, really under Cindy's leadership, uh, a really great job of removing those silos between the departments. Um, when I became the property and customer service manager in 2018, that was definitely one of my goals is to um, push those silos away, have us all work as one big team. Um, part of that, in 2017, that was the last odd year election that Sc Scott County would administer elections for the city's township school districts. So we focus on the even year elections and uh, we pull in staff from whatever area we need. Um, I call Amanda our boots on the ground. She is our right hand um, that does the everyday. She's the expert in the everyday work. Um, and she does a fantastic job of balancing that with her duties in the recorder's office as well. Um, Janice has, as we've gone on in time, her role has definitely evolved from being more of the land records chief deputy um, <laughs> that I would always tease her and working more into especially absentee, but in 2022 even more expanded her role. Um, Chris has been doing this um, for quite a while now and um, she's taught me a lot. She, she knows a lot about what we do. And as we've moved along, we've definitely evolved in our duties, but it is very rare. It is a balancing act of um, making sure the work is prioritized and gotten done without actually staffing it. We do bring a good deal amount of staff along um, during those even year elections. We bring staff in to work in the office to do everyday duties to especially support Amanda. Um, and then we bring temps on board. In 2020, we hired 27 people to help us with our elections from doing our drop sites to uh, running our absentee room, um, ballot board, those kinds of things. So it is a, uh, it is a balance and a juggling act. I don't know if you want to add anything about that, David. So one of the narratives we tell the legislature is there's only nine counties in the state that have full-time election staff and predominantly they're in the metro area. Um, so the majority of the counties in Minnesota, it's similar to this where the election, the staff running elections have multiple duties and it's real, I think it's really important when the legislature makes as many changes as they have made this year that they understand that because most counties don't have the resources to really implement major changes in an election year. Thank you. I hope, I hope you're as proud as I think our organization is no. of, of that work Thank you. To, to break down silos and collaborate. I'll I'll follow up with, with that and kind of a general comment in that same area. So transparency has been mentioned a lot in here. So, and you guys have done a, a tremendous amount of work in that area. So just for the audience, can you kind of summarize what, what you have done and what you're doing kind of moving forward in that area? It's evident that, you know, we've got a, uh, in, uh, in, as you mentioned, Chris, a, uh, a growing uh, age-wise in, in the county. We've got a, uh, a uh, growing diversity in the county and your education process, you've made a lot of strides in that area. So if you kind of summarize those, those points and what you're doing to help educate the public. Sure. Um, speaking to the transparency part of the question, uh, one of the things that we tried really hard to do, especially in 2022, is do as much as we could in a public forum. Um, elections is a constant balance of transparency and voter security and privacy. Um, it's walking that knife's edge of giving uh, people the look into the process without revealing data. So we did our absentee ballot board that we did hire election judges for. Uh, we did our absentee ballot opening. We did our absentee ballot running of ballots in a public conference room, um, which Speaking of security, then, of course, um, elections is a hot button topic, right? So it's something that 
when we did the planning for this, we balanced what the public could come in and see, uh, making sure we had egress for our staff. You know, you have to think about those things now. So those are some of the things that we've done for transparency. We advertise that um, both on our monument sign, in the newspaper, in the Scott County scene, the website, those kinds of things so that we could invite people in to see the process. Um, that's something that we're really proud of that we've been able to do and will continue to do in the future. Uh, we have some ideas, of course, about how we can educate the public more on our process. Um, something that we heard about recently was kind of an elections academy um, to invite the citizens in to see what it is that we do. Um, I do our election judge training with support of our staff and having something similar to that available to citizens to come in and see um, to remove that mystery. Elections should not be mysterious. Um, it is just a process and we want people to understand that. Um, as far as the education piece, we are learning a lot about continuing education. And I know, David, I've asked to maybe speak to that a little bit. Uh, but there are opportunities out there more so than ever for folks like myself and our team to take election classes, uh, for example, through the hum Humphrey Institute. Um, it is something that you can't get a degree in um, in elections administration. But there are educational programs out there that are available that would be really valuable for us. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. You Sure. So if you're not aware, um, Minnesota is very fortunate because at the University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs, they have an elections administrator certification program. The other one is based in Houston, Texas, and it's connected with Auburn University. So. I was fortunate enough to be appointed to the advisory board at the Humphrey, and we were really trying to encourage as many election administrators in the state to go through the program because the goal really is, and I hate to use the word, professionalize our um, job, which hasn't been the case in the past, but I think it's really a foundation. I hired someone out of the Humphrey program. He was outstanding, and he got stolen away from me as Washington County's elections manager. <laughs> Amy and Amy, I'm just wondering if if you have thoughts about the improvements in transparency and security from the city level. You want to go first? Um, it's a very high consideration. We're very um, the public has a lot of opinions and misinformation, so we're always welcome to have them come and watch and see what we do. Um, I love it when they want to learn and they ask good questions. Um, and what we can do to improve that education is, is valuable um, because we should have trust in the system mm -hmm. and have the transparency. Um, it's vital to having that trust in our system. I would agree with that. So 2022 was my first year with the city of Credit River. My day job is actually communications in Hennepin County. And so first and foremost, the partnership with Scott County was absolutely instrumental. And I think one of the things that I heard from our residents as they came in and voted absentee for the first time in person at the Credit River Government Center was um, they felt like they knew that the election was happening in ways that perhaps they hadn't before because of the sending of the postcard. Um, I had, I don't know how many people who walked in um, and said, I don't know if I need this actually to vote, but I brought it with me, and it let me know that I had this option. And I thought that was absolutely essential. Um, I think we have tried as a community to make sure that our ballot boards have been posted, um, that we have done what we could in, in order to make sure that the process is as, is as transparent as possible. But I think there's some other things that we can continue to do and continue to learn. And that partnership with this group is going to be instrumental in order to do that. So um, the idea of having um, a residence academy specific to voting would really intrigue a number of our voters, I think. And so trying to figure out how that could be implemented given the resource constraints that you all face, I do think it would be well worth the time and investment. 
So I, I know your office relies some on volunteers um, for election judges and those kinds of things. Is that a training? Like could, uh, could volunteers be part of an academy presentation or training that it wouldn't have? Like, because I appreciate your sensitivity to the staff capacity, Amy, but we have some other resources. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sure. Great idea. I have a question. Um, on page three of your narrative, you um, kind of talk about current legislative initiatives. And you reference early registration of seven, 16 and 17 year olds. I'm wondering if you can say a little more about that. Like, what is the kind of the purpose and the benefit of registering youth before they're able to vote? Sure. Um, we spoke with legislators about that this year, about tell us more about why you're um, asking for this to be part of, you know, part of the legislation. Um, I am the legislative co-chair for the Minnesota Association of County Officers. So I work with uh, David's office, with legislators directly, those kinds of things, um, go to testify in different initiatives as needed, meet with legislators in person on Zoom, those kinds of things. Um, and that is one of the questions that we asked. And really, I think it's the reverse of the uh, what do we look at when we look at our population and how we're aging? How do we engage um, youth earlier in the process? One of the things that I've seen nationally <coughs> is that the um, Gen Z, if you will, that group is pretty... Um, underrepresented in their voting numbers. So just to get people engaged and aware, I, I believe is is the biggest part of, of why that was put into legislation this year. I mean, could you go to page six, please? Do we have thoughts? Well, Kevin, I appreciate your, your comments about that, Julie. We have a pretty high percentage of voter turnout in Scott County, and I'm wondering if people have thoughts about what supports that. Like, why is it different here? I don't know that I can tell you why it's different. We do have a very active, engaged population that want to have their voice heard, which is great. Um, we try to produce as much communication as we can, and that, of course, is an area that we're trying to improve. Um, to Tony's question about our diverse population growing, uh, we want to work with partners in the community to educate people on what their options are. We've tried to do everything we can think of to say, here's all your options. And voting is a, is a right, of course, um, but it's not something everyone wants to do. And it's not something that we can force people to do. That is absolutely their choice. But we want to make sure that we put all of those options out there. There are options for absentee, if they want to vote in person, by mail, um, if they're a UOCAVA voter, which is a, a uniform or overseas citizen, can vote um, in a different manner because they're not here in Minnesota right now. Um, just really try to communicate. Um, but knowing, stepping into this role, our voter turnout has always been high. Mm -hmm. So um, I really just believe we have a population that wants to be involved. Where, where does our voting rank compared to the rest of the metro counties? Where is Minnesota across the United States? And then it's on this uh, page six figure as well. And then is there anything being done specifically in the midterms since that's much different value or percentage. Mm -hmm. So is there anything targeting that? As far as your question as to where we fall in the metro, we're kind of right in the middle. Um, some of the other counties are, Hennepin for instance, is, is quite a bit higher than we are. Um, and I attribute a lot of that to their communication. Um, I'd like to model a lot of the things that we do. They have a wonderful communications team over there in Hennepin. Um, <laughs> and they, they have the staff to do it. So um, the counties are really, really great about sharing. No one's expected to recreate the wheel. And if you've done this, may I borrow that? May I use that on my website? Everyone's fantastic about working together. So there are a lot of things out there that I'd like to model, and I think that pushes their voter registration up quite a bit. Um, as far as in nationally, Minnesota is traditionally number one 
in elections turnout. We um, jockey with, is it Massachusetts? Colorado. Colorado for number one. So we fight real hard mm -hmm. to be at that number one spot, and we pretty consistently fall at that number one spot, which is definitely something to be proud of. Um, and I apologize. You asked a third part of your question. Yeah, just the, the midterm uh, elections. Sure. Um, well, 2022 was a unique year for us in that we had redistricting. So every 10 years, um, the movement of the legislative boundaries occurs due to the shift in population after, you know, after the census determines where do people really live. Um, so we built a redistricting team to present to the board to allow them to choose the best plan. Um, part of that, we made the decision, like Amy referred to, to send out uh, what we call a PVC, a postal verification card, to every registered voter in the state, or I'm sorry, in the county. Um, and you'll see on one of the charts the number of uh, postal verification cards that we sent. Let me find which page that is. Was somewhere in the neighborhood of 110,000. So that's on page 10. Um, and that's in our voter registration accuracy chart. Um, that was a, a really big difference for us to go from a normal year of, you know, somewhere between 15, 20,000 of those cards that went out to 110,000. Um, so I think that, like Amy said, really reiterated to folks, hey, you know, you're registered to vote, here's your location. If your location changed, here's your new one. Um, but yeah, the midterm turnout is, is very different, um, obviously, than what 2024 is going to be. We are gearing up um, for a huge turnout for the presidential election. Um, and it really just varies. That's the thing about elections, is you really have to go into it preparing for a huge turnout. I can't prepare for a 25% turnout on a midterm. I have to prepare, prepare for very much higher, because what if we're in the 90s, right? So our ballot orders and our supply orders and all of those things have to reflect um, what it could be, so. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just go had a ahead. quick question staying on the same chart. So there's a really high accuracy rate um, with the voter registration. Can you talk about, like, what is considered an inaccurate registration? It looks like it's, it's um, referred to differently than an incomplete. So what makes something inaccurate? Sure. Um, in 2022 in particular, with the volume of postal verification cards that went out, that's the measure. That's the way we've come up with to measure that accuracy. So if we attempt to mail you your postal verification card at your home and it gets returned to us, it gets labeled by the post office as to why you couldn't deliver it. Mm. Um, and then Amanda goes through and decodes those very mysterious codes <laughs> on those postcards um, to try and determine what exactly that means. Um, some of those are people are out of state right? Maybe they're snowbirds, they're on an extended vacation. Um, maybe the post office doesn't recognize that that person is registered to receive mail. But I will say, um, in direct correlation to the volume that we sent out, we had a lot that was returned. Um, returned, we had 4,300, which out of 110,000 isn't a lot. Um, but based on the phone calls that we got from voters that said, well, wait, I've been living here for 30 years. Um, we know that that's not perfect either. Um, but an incomplete registration would be more of someone providing their information to register to vote, especially on paper. Um, they're very hard to read, of course, when they're handwritten. Uh, we do get a lot of paper voter registration applications in the mail. Uh, they may forget their birth date or part of their name or their address or something like that. So that would be more incomplete versus um, inaccurate when something comes back in the mail and they're simply not at that address. They registered there, but they don't live there. Um, and it does happen. We've passed along um, a handful, maybe 10 actually to the FBI uh, for folks that registered at addresses that don't have homes yet. 
So. Evan, could we go to page nine, please? Certainly about this measure here, um, there's language that I, I think a lot of residents would certainly find important that part of our job is to ensure no voter has voted twice or that folks ineligible to vote have been able to cast a ballot. And I think this is Chris's area, right? The voter record post-election review. And it says since the implementation of electronic poll books in 2018, the voter record is more accurate. Do we have data on how much, like how accurate is the voter record and what is the, what is the improvement from going from the handwritten to the poll books? Because this data just looks at the hours spent and there's a, a tremendous efficiency gain, but I'm wondering about the, the shift in accuracy as well. Um, I don't know. Do you, I don't, we don't. I don't have any statistics. I guess to share. We, yeah, we don't necessarily have statistics. That's definitely something to try and go back and look at. Uh, when I stepped into elections, poll books were just coming in. The very first election was the primary in 2018, um, so I hadn't done the paper voter registrations from election day in the past. Um, the two of you have both entered and, and done that data. Um, poll books hasn't made it perfect. Um, there is still a human element of entering that data um, on the front end. I think we made a really huge improvement in 2022. Um, the poll book will allow someone to add an address. And that is a necessary function. Because as much as we ask for address to be submitted to us, um, from the cities for us to be able to get all of that in the statewide voter registration system. Sometimes things happen, um, especially after redistricting and things shifted in that. Um, we were able to lock down those poll books so they could not add an address unless they called me first <laughs> and said, um, it won't let me. It's asking me to manually precinct this voter. And I said, hit the back button two times. So we'd go back and then we'd walk through it again. And um, I believe we only had to add two addresses on election day. Um, so I, I think that Chris spent less time doing address cleanup, but that's anecdotal. It, it isn't solid data that we have. Um, I know Chris said that she spent um, time cleaning everything up and sometimes it's av versus avenue you know and those kinds of things because if you try and upload it <coughs> to the statewide voter registration system and it's not an exact match it's just not going to take so she spends the bulk of this time is going through those files so is there an, a, an interface with like usps or what what is it matching against okay there is um in the statewide voter registration system there are verifications through USPS and a whole host of other systems. Um, when we did our redistricting, we chose to delete all of the old addresses out of the statewide voter registration system and upload all of the new addresses because the data entry needed um, to correct what was there, we decided was going to be too onerous. Um, we had some issues. It wasn't perfect, um, but overall, considering all the uh, many thousands of addresses that we have, and of course the almost hundred thousand voters that we have, um, the problems were were pretty small. So, so the verification is done in SVRS with the Postal Service. Um, then that information is transferred into the poll books. So when you're entering an address or something, it's pulling up whatever was, came from SVRS into the poll. If I could add, so in, <clears throat> I was a city clerk in Minnetonk, and we were the first jurisdiction in the state to use poll books. We started using them in 2009. So I really pushed for it statewide because based on what I was hearing from our election judges, that it walked them through processes and helped to eliminate mistakes, particularly election day registration. It doesn't let you miss a step. And I think that's one of the reasons that they've improved accuracy. There was a reference in the written material to us having to replace poll books. Has that happened or that will happen? 
It's happening this summer. It's happening this summer. And what's the funding mechanism for that? Those are being, the equipment technically is owned. Um, 2018, when we put in poll books, the county portion of that, um, because it was purchased um, in aid, in partnership with a grant, um, was paid for by Scott County. So the current um, iPads that are the poll books are owned by Scott County, but that was delivered with the expectation that the cities and townships would be responsible for any replacement cost. So the reason they need to be replaced um, is simply because they're aging out because their iPads and Apple only supports them so long. Of course, we are not going to, I mean, the physical iPad could last another 10 years, but we are not gonna risk not being able to have those security patches and those things in there. So the funding for the um, few <coughs> iPads that we own, we own five or six, um, the county does pay for, but the cities and townships pay for those upgrades themselves. Um, tabulator equipment as well is owned by the city or township, and we have a small handful of backup and our absentee machines. Okay, thank you. On, on page 11, so actually a post-election review has got to be within one half of 1% and, and we're greatly exceeding that. So is this like operator error or hanging chads or what? <laughs> That's old, right? Don't do that. <laughs> Go on now. <laughs> so I mean, what are some things that you discovered? It's a very small percent, but I'm just kind of curious. I mean, what, what are you finding? The Florida. And is the whole thing tossed out then or just that, that portion that was not accurate or what, what happens with that? Really? Um, it actually... No hanging chads, let's be clear. <laughs> we don't have those here anymore. We've, we've not had those here, right. but those don't exist anymore. I know. Um, generally, the, what we see is uh, maybe someone filled out a ballot in pencil and we didn't know um, or didn't realize. Um, the other thing is, and that's something that we introduced into legislation this year, is... On the ballot itself, when you do a write-in, you need to fill in the circle, right, with your very special approved marker. And then you need to write in who the person is that you are voting for. Um, if you don't fill in the circle, the machine doesn't count it as a write-in. So they go through, and there's a possibility that when this hand count, this post-election review is being done, um, that you would you would have gotten a vote that maybe you didn't get before because it didn't get filled in and officially counted as a write-in. That is actually something that uh, we've tried to have changed through legislation is to make everything the same. Um, really, those were our, our biggest things. Um, very little other issues. I don't know if you saw other things in other places, David. It's typically that voter marks about marginally where they'll put like an X instead of filling in the so the machine might catch it or it might not. So it's typically the way, or, or they use the marking device that the tabulator has a hard time reading. So would this data suggest to you that those tabulators are pretty accurate? Yes. 99.9% .9 accurate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the 2020 election was the first election that we held since the reconstruction of the buildings and the new space, and you guys moved around a little bit and all of those things in the process. And I'm wondering if you, if someone can talk about what that meant for security and, and um, just how that reset after the building construction. Sure. Um, the construction, the reconstruction, um, the layout that we were able to have our voices heard for the um, elections room, the secure, we have a secure elections room and a secure, secure elections room, like a ballot storage room. Um, the layers of security that you need to go through to simply get to that room 
Um, everything is badged access now. So um, folks, some folks can get into, say, the storage room for elections, which is where we keep our blank envelopes and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but only a very small handful of us have access to the secure ballot storage. Um, no keys. Everything is badged access set up through facility. Um, the improvements that it's brought really has been vast. Um, we have a lot of steps. Everything is kind of spread out a bit. Um, but the layers of security, um, the improvements we've been able to make, and even utilizing, balancing, like I said, that security with the transparency um, has been really great. No one really knows where the elections room is, which is the way it should be and the way that we will keep it. Um, only those with access are allowed down there. And um, it's, it's vastly improved to what we had before. Um, it was secure before, but the elections storage room was um, approximately the size of a postage stamp. Um, and we had to keep everything in there. So um, it really was a challenge. Um, and our workstations and all of those kinds of things. So uh, with the way this building has been set up, even with the no public access to the staff areas has, has done a lot for us. Thank you. In addition to that, just the two large conference rooms that are right off of the atrium is a great opportunity for us to be able to do some new things and invite the public in. because you, you never know how many people are going to come to watch you. Mm -hmm. So... Um, previously, we would have a smaller um, conference room where we would um, maybe do our public accuracy testing, but now we have a larger room, and we could use both of those rooms, one of them for ballot board and one of them for ballot opening or whatever the case might be. So that was that was a great improvement as well. So this discussion's around page 12. Okay. To that. So can you... And it, it is trending in the right direction, but can you just talk about what those percentages mean and its precinct reporting balance? Absolutely. Um, we go through the reports from the precincts after every election. So after all of the returns and the materials and the equipment come back from the cities and townships, they bring that all back to us. Uh, we as a team sit down and go through all of the precinct numbers. Um, what I always like to kid about with this one is math is hard. Um, and after Amy and Amy, I'm sure can attest, I know uh, my very first call in an election, my first election, I got a call um, from Bell Plain at 515 in the morning. So folks are starting their mornings at five o'clock and they're not ending until the polls close after eight, plus all the other time that you put in. So really generally what I feel like we see with this is math is hard. Um, there is a tabulator tape at the end of the night that you have to fill out with how many ballots you received, blank ballots, how many blank ballots you're sending back to us, how many voters uh, checked in on the poll pad, um, how many ballots you ended up with in your tabulator, um, and it's okay to have more voters checked in than you have ballots. It is possible that someone could show up, and it does happen, um, that people show up to vote on election day. They look at the ballot and they go, well, this isn't what I thought it was, and they leave. Um, so they may have checked in, but they have not voted their ballot. So um, there's a, a host of reasons why something like that could happen, and it doesn't mean anything bad. It's just that out of the 53 precincts, we had four that had something that was off. And again, like I said, not, not bad or nefarious, just not everything came out to zero. So. All right. I'm just wondering, so you are, uh, this is a group that has really, like, if you look at the data over time, high performance over time across the years, across the elections. Um, you have talked today about efforts to continue to build on those, on really strong performance. And I'm wondering two years from now, you'll be back in front of this board. Like, what do you hope to talk about? 
like what's going to be different or better two years from now? I'm hoping to be retired. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be a viewer. <laughs> Janice will be in the audience. Um, really one of the focus items that I would like to spend time on is something that we touched on a little bit is communicating with our growing diverse population. Um, that is an opportunity that we need to take advantage of and working with your team, Chris, and community leaders across the county to try and educate people on what those opportunities are, um, as well as election judge recruitment. Of course, you have to be a citizen to vote. You have to be a citizen to be an election judge. Um, but there are many citizens across the county that maybe haven't been exposed to elections. Um, one of the things I always like to, to stress, too, is there's a lot of fear of the government, right, in other places in the world and not like what we grew up with. So we want to bring the friendly face of, hey, we're here for Scott, we're Scott County, we're here to help you, we're here to help you learn, um, and we'd love to have you come in and, and be a part of um, election judging and voting and those kinds of things. Um, especially here in this area in Shakopee. I know that the city of Shakopee um, definitely would welcome, I know other cities would as well, would welcome a more diverse election judge base. So those are the kind of things that we really want to focus on um, to bring us to where we are. We want people to walk into a polling place and see someone that looks like them. Are there other things that you would hope to build on? Um, I think communication with the voters to get the information out there. Um, we try many different ways with websites, with newsletters, with the newspaper. Um, and to get them the accurate information um, is really important, too, um, in reaching the diverse population. There is a lot of people that, you know, I've always voted. I've always, but then there's the other side where the... They don't know when there's, it's a little fearful for them and they don't really want to come in. Um, so, and it's the communication and to build that relationship with the community. I would agree. I think that is going to be a big thing. And one of the challenges I think too, and Julie knows this far better than I do, is just, you know, you look at the demographics for um, Scott County and our election judges do tend to be, you know, very seasoned um, in terms of experience <laughs> with voting, serving as a, as a voting, uh, as an election judge. But the population of those judges also does tend to, you know, skew toward retirees, people who have the time. And one of our election judges was a college student. And I said, can you recruit a few friends for next time? Mm -hmm. um, just the idea that it can help um, ensure that continuity so that we can continue to administer elections is going to be important. So, but um, yeah, I would agree. I think communication is going to be a big thing. And also for the city's perspective is the partnership with the county. Absolutely. Because um, as a city, it's we need the expertise of the county staff to assist us when we have questions. And I, I just have to offer my sincere thanks and compliment to the entire team. Every time I had a question, I had somebody on the phone within two rings, and I had one instance um, where I need, can I call you back in five minutes? I want to say it was about two. And it was absolutely instrumental to make sure we had throughput for the voters who wanted to feed their ballots into the machine and make sure that we were following both the spirit and the, and the letter of the law. Um, so I, we could not do that in a small community like Credit River if it wasn't for that wonderful partnership from you all. That I can say is one of the things that I think I'm proudest of um, in the five years that I've been in this role is the partnership that we've been able to build with our cities, our townships, and our school districts. Um, those relationships are mm -hmm. incredibly valuable. Um, this is not something we could do without them. It absolutely isn't. Um, and sometimes I think you hear that lip service. <laughs> we couldn't do this without you. No. And I tell the election judges in training the same thing. We could not do this without you. 
and we value um, each and every one of them and the relationships and um, something that we started with the general election in 2020 uh, was drop sites. We don't have drop boxes for ballots in Scott County. And in fact, we have a drop box here at the, the campus um, for folks to drop other things for anywhere across the county. If we get a ballot in that drop box, it gets rejected and they get a new ballot. And there is a sign on the front of the, of the um, box that says that we will not take an absentee ballot that way. The direction we decided to go was manned drop sites. Um, so we set up staff with an iPad and county internet and we hire the staff but they host them. So we were able to provide as many options as possible for ballot return, which in 2020 especially uh, was something that was very important. We will continue that for the general elections in the future. Um, but again, drop boxes, just like everything in elections can be controversial. So we have um, just completely gone away from that and stayed away from that. And the turnout in the primary um, and the presidential nomination primary coming up in March is, is low enough that the demand for that is not as high. Uh, but we'll see that in the general election uh, next year as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think with that, Mr. Chair, I will return it back to you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Any questions or comments? I, and I, I want to start with uh, one, and I'm going to ask uh, David. Uh, when is... When were all the votes tabulated, like for the 2022 election? Like you had everything in and all results were out throughout the state. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, good question. So basically we had everything on election night. I think we went home at like three o'clock in the morning. But I mean, everything meaning it was 99%. We'd have okay. stray numbers coming in the next day. Okay. And the reason I ask is, you know, sometimes you see across the country, and I don't know if they're using like stones and tablets to get votes <laughs> or what, but how come you, know, you see, well, this race, they haven't counted everything yet. And, it's, it, and it seems like a, a week, we have our results here, what, 10 o'clock at night? It's like 11? Uh, just asking that. Why is that, do you think? Well, first of all, very good point. Each state is very different on the way that it runs oh, yeah. elections. But um, one of the things in Minnesota that's unique is we don't have provisional balloting, which is in states that have that, they, the voter votes about but doesn't get counted until they get verified. And most states have that. So there's always going to be a pool of ballots in most states that don't get counted on election night. Other states also have postmark for their mail ballots oh. where it has to be postmarked by a certain day. And ours, we have to have them on election day. And so, again, in every state's a little bit different, but in Minnesota, we basically have everything on election night. Because you could almost say, well, we've got 4,000 of these provisional ballots, but this, the only race that could be, you know, determined differently is ahead by 6,000. So you could almost call those races, though, couldn't you? Or Mr. Chair, I had to hold my boss back on that. In 2020, we did have a postmark. <laughs> Absentee ballots could be postmarked, had to be postmarked by election day and then could be received afterwards, which was okay. unique to the pandemic. Yeah. And my boss basically said, can we tell the press if there's 200 outstanding ballots out and somebody is ahead by 300 that they've pretty it's much, over. yeah. And we really didn't want to do that. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Can I, can I add yes. to that point sure. as well, Mr. Chair? Um, one of the other things that is different and unique about Minnesota is we are able to open absentee ballots before Election Day. Um, a lot of states do allow that, but some do not. So they cannot open absentee ballot envelopes until the polls close. So they cannot report those okay. results for however long it takes them. Um, Michigan is one of those states. So when you hear in the news that they're still not reporting and they're still not counted, that's a big part of that is they may have had, you know, we had um, just in our county in 2022, 18% absentee. If they had 20% of their voters that voted absentee, they can't even touch those until the polls close. Okay. So they're not waiting for some little old lady who forgot she had 2,300 votes in her trunk to <laughs> show up at the... <laughs> I don't know, and we've all heard that story, right? It's like, 
What do you mean you forgot? Anyhow, okay, sorry. Any other questions or comments? Yep, go ahead, Commissioner Beer. Oh, you go ahead, Commissioner Beer. I'll just make some comments and save a long email because it's just all positive, good stuff. I I really appreciate. I know it's hard and it can be very difficult for staff that we don't have any full time election staff, but but. From this chair as a board member, from my taxpayer chair, thank you. I mean, that's that's the right way government should go. And it makes me feel better for continuity and knowledge of the process. Just even the last seven years, looking at how many more people really can understand and speak to elections. And it's kind of like an emergency preparedness thing with staffing. So I do appreciate that. Do acknowledge that it can be difficult. And, and I get it when you look at some other counties who maybe have dedicated election staff who not only run the elections, but then have time to think and improve and do data all the rest of the year when you have all kinds of other jobs. So thank you. I appreciate it. I still think it's the right way to go. Um, love the talk about um, just election education or election news. The community, because of so many of these things we hear, is very interested in elections and finding some ways that it's not necessarily all staff, but maybe volunteers, maybe some of our election judges can get go out and spread that message can help all of us, when I say all of us as government, with kind of the anti-government angst and the distrust to really go out there and, and I think community members hearing from their peers about the process, being able to ask questions is just great. So I know early on we talked about a possibility of that, I liked that. Um, but otherwise, just thank you. And I think, yes, motivating younger folks to get involved. My I don't know how old he is, my youngest kid, 23, I guess. Um, he served as an election judge for the city of Shakopee the last couple of elections. It was a great experience. I think because he did it at this age, he'll continue doing it whenever it works in his life. Um, it would just somehow to get him there, and then we'll, we'll keep him for a long time. So I appreciate all your efforts there. Thank you. Commissioner Beer. Thank you very much. Uh, the what is it? The last no, no sorry. Uh, page eleven. The accuracy of post-election review. This is this is is this the um, bar chart where we talk about doing two or three precincts when you do that? So, full disclosure, I have been one that has reached into that hat literally and pulled out precincts. No <laughs> funny business. No nothing. Um, and I watched, gone upstairs to watch the recount when they were. Well, I guess here. Um, there's always a little something here and there, but super high numbers of accuracy. Um, and those are always open for people to, even in COVID, I think we had some plastic or something, but they could still peer in. Um, like I haven't seen or gotten a sniff or heard or what was that uh, of anything off uh, except truth. So, so that's awesome. Uh, but I also just wonder, you know, like page 10 and then, um, I don't know, was it Tony that brought up page 12? You know, you have these little, the collective, we have these little potential rooms for misinformation and um, things to blossom and bloom. So it's like, you know, however we could close those gaps to just remove any possibility for things to grow. Um, and I can't help but wonder if voter ID would help. And, and here's my question on this. I don't get why voter ID is so politically charged. I don't get it. Can you help me, anyone? Why Why is that not the law of the land? And I don't get it. I don't get why it's such a heartbreak for some people. Do you want me to pick someone to answer that? <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing it out there. I mean, we got a guy from the state. You know, we let's do it that way. <laughs> Commissioner Beer, I can't really tell you why it's so politically charged. I just don't know. I can tell you that I spend a lot of my time talking to voters and talking about why elections is not political. Elections is a bipartisan, nonpartisan, really nonpartisan process. Um, we all, elections administrators across the state, um, set our politics aside and just do the job. Uh, like Amy referred to, to the spirit and the letter of the law. Um, I can tell you it is definitely a hot button topic. What we do, of course, is we enforce the law. Um, I got more questions about that in election judge training this past year than I ever have. 
And to be honest, my response is always, we enforce the law. So we let the legislators decide how they want it to be. Um, legislation this year is huge in the elections arena. There will be a lot of things changing. Um, but we enforce whatever it is. And I know we do locally. Like, I totally get that. Like, that's where I'm saying, like, I've been the one, on, you know, when I was, wasn't on the ballot to pick out what precincts we're going to get randomly, um, you know, looked over. Um, I've seen the room. Like, there's no, like, you know, there's no big black rolling box of mysterious paper showing up or water main breaks or, you know, some guy looking the, up at the light. Um, I know, I know it works at the local level. And I also understand that the core infrastructure of elections is a political, but is that, that part is that part is, but good night in the last few cycles, it has been anything but that the infrastructure has, has been apolitical, but wow, political parties going crazy on getting those votes in any which way they can. So that's why I just like, if you got voter ID and things are, does it make this, uh, I lost my page, but you know, the, the reconciliation of the uh, registration report, does that increase that reporting percentage? Um, and then the bigger one is, does that help also, you know, math being hard, does that help precinct reports being balanced? So there's just no, it just eliminates the possibility of questions. I'm looking at you, but I, I guess I'm really looking at the state, you know, what the state has to say about that. Like, I don't get it. I need an ID for so many things, okay. simple Let's things. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to deflect your question a little bit because voter ID has been a political issue ever since I've been an election administrator. I think the political <laughs> argument is um, there's certain populations that have harder time getting IDs. I will just point out, though, that there are verifications going on behind the scenes. I might not be aware. I think Julie mentioned, but... All voter registrations are checked against the driver's license database or social security database and verified that way. We belong to a group or a consortium of states you might have heard about called ERIC, where we share, we are allowed to share data across states. So if someone moves to Wisconsin, the two, the two of us are talking to each other and we inactivate what. So there are things going on behind the scenes. We do have voter ID for election day registration. I mean, so the most typical way to election day register is to show your driver's license. And, and, and that's because we're not doing the upfront verification that's done on other voter registrations. Huh. The other piece of that is when you absentee vote, which I know is a lot of, for folks, a lot of the mystery, right? Um, you do have to provide identity verification. So you have to provide your driver's license, the last four of your social. Um, and we match that um, last case scenario if that information is missing we can we don't our absentee ballot board judges can do a signature verification so there are other verifications of course that are done as well thank you i, I have one more quick before i forget this one and anyone from the secretary of state office can answer this um <laughs> 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 It'll be an easy one. You know, in some races, you know, if, there, if I don't know if it's under a quarter percent, you know, you do a recount or whatever, and someone say, oh, um, they only lost by 38 out of, you know, 40,000 votes or whatever. And they say, oh, they, they might have won it. How often does it come out, though, that the person who had, like, 50 point, you know, 25 percent that, that won by a little bit actually gained votes over the guy that lost? Because statistically, there should be you know, almost half the time where the winner gets a few more votes than the person who actually lost. You, you see what I'm saying? Yep. So the recounts I've been involved with have never flipped the winner. Okay. The, the threshold for most races is one half of 1%. And our, like we were talking before, our voting equipment is extremely accurate. Yep. So to flip that many votes would be very difficult. I think, I mean, obviously, if you win a race by one vote, it's more likely you might win that recount. The, the recounts I've seen tend to, um, the difference between an election night and the recount is, again, because the voter marks a ballot in a way that can't, the machine can't read, but a human can determine voter intent. So in recounts, it's not unusual for um, candidates to gain votes, but it usually is not one-sided. It's both candidates. Both sides should be able to gain. Yep. What's the most votes that have ever, you know, 
if it's been like 10 votes, would you say that's maybe a chance for the guy that lost, or is it got to be less than that almost? It really depends on the size of the race. Obviously, a commissioner okay. race is different than a state representative race. But, okay. yeah, I mean, again, the voting equipment is incredibly It's pretty accurate, accurate yeah. out there. Pretty good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Brennan. Um, there's been uh, conversations regarding ranked choice voting, and can a county do that um, abro uh, across the whole county, or can an individual um, race do that, or you know, is that something that you see coming up in, in Scott County? Currently, um, we cannot. There, in the potential legislation, there was a task force being developed to study ranked choice voting. Currently, only first class cities, is that the correct? It's charter cities. Charter cities, thank you, um, can adopt ranked choice voting if they choose. Um, but there really haven't been studies on what happens. Um, they're independent on their off year elections or in their independent standalone elections, they can adopt ranked choice voting. So for the city of Minneapolis, for example. Um, but it's not something that can be done right now on the same ballot as, for instance, your race. So um, it is being looked into. Um, the Ranked Choice Voting Task Force has evolved into a Secretary of State kind of study um, that will look into and determine if Ranked Choice Voting for whatever races are allowed can be on the same ballot as, say, for instance, like the Secretary of State's race. Um, currently, that's not a thing that can be done. Um, so there's, there's looking into it. Um, and I know that there were some recommendations that the legislature was possibly looking for upon conclusion of a study to determine the feasibility of can things be intermingled. Okay, thank you. Very good discussion, very good topic today. So.